Good evening and welcome to this AZ Votes 2024 special edition of Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Tonight we feature a debate between the four Republican candidates running for three open seats on the Arizona Corporation Commission. The commission is best known for regulating utilities but also has judicial and executive powers and regulates securities and pipelines as well as incorporates new businesses. Candidates in tonight's debate will be given 90 seconds to reply to questions and a 45 second rebuttal will be offered. Opening and closing statements will be made in alphabetical order. Let's go ahead and introduce the candidates again in alphabetical order. Christy Kelly is a professional mediator, consultant, and freelance journalist. Renee Lopez served in the U.S. Navy and is a former Chandler City Councilman. Leah Marquez Peterson is an entrepreneur and a current member of the Arizona Corporation Commission. And Rachel Walden is a member of the Mesa Unified School District Governing Board. Let's go ahead and begin with opening statements, and we start with Christy Kelly. Arizona, I am so happy to be here tonight. I am asking for a shot to be elected as your next corporation commissioner. I'm asking for you to place me as in the primary and also in the general. I am a wife, I'm a mom, I live in the West Valley. Now, I am a mediator. I've spent 16 years being a mediator and an arbitrator. That skill is gonna be important. We need more civility in our politics. We need somebody that's gonna be able to get two people in a room, talk about things, and come out with an agreement on the other side. Also, one of my number one priorities is to bring more visibility to the office of the Corporation Commission. A lot of people don't know what it is and doesn't even know that it exists. If they do, they don't know what it does. So again, I am looking to be your ratepayer advocate and to put Arizona first in everything that I do. Thank you very much. And we turn now to Renee Lopez. Thank you, Ted. So I'm a third generation Arizona native and a third generation Navy veteran. I got my degree in nuclear engineering and minor in direct energy conversion from the University of Arizona. I earned my commission in the Navy, served as an officer aboard special operations on submarine platforms. And when I left the Navy, I uh, worked in project management in telecom and oil and gas, and then now in IT. So I came back here in Arizona in 2007 to finish raising my family and got involved in the community. And I was fortunate and honored enough to represent the city of Chandler uh, for eight years, vice mayor twice, and also served uh, as a Chandler, uh, on the Chandler seat for the Arizona Waters Municipal Water Users Association. So those six years actually exposed me a lot of the water policy statewide. And I want to continue to serve uh, Arizona as I did for the citizens of Chandler. I want to serve the citizens of Arizona representing you on the Arizona Corporation Commission. And I hope to earn your support. Thank you very much. And we turn now to Leah Marquez Peterson. Thank you. My name is Leah Marquez Peterson. I'm a wife, a mother, a small business owner, and I'm running for re-election to the Arizona Corporation Commission. I've served on the commission since 2019, and I'm a conservative voice for ratepayers. While serving on the commission, I have fought for energy reliability, especially in standing up against uh, out-of-state special interest groups that have brought uh, policies to the state that threaten our reliability. I've also stood for affordable rates for our ratepayers, especially seniors in our most vulnerable areas or on fixed incomes. Uh, I have uh, approved a $40 million rebate for APS and TEP customers. Uh, a utility scale moratorium on disconnections during the global pandemic, and recently approved a $200 million rate cut for APS customers uh, during the recent rate case. I appreciate and want your support for this upcoming reelection. Uh, you can go to voteforlea.com to learn more about my voting record, and I would appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you. And we wrap up our opening statements with Rachel Walden. Hi, I'm Rachel Walden, and I'm running for the commission to uphold the Arizona Constitution and protect the ratepayer and ensure that we have reliable and affordable utilities now and for future generations. I love Arizona. I've lived here for 39 years. I went to ASU for my undergrad and my graduate work, and I worked for ASU as a teaching and research assistant. Then I had a career in business and finance. My clients were large market corporations, and I worked with government regulations, compliance, and audits. And I currently serve on the Mesa School Board. I am a proven fighter. It's the largest school district in the state, and I prioritize fiscal responsibility, transparency, and parental rights. You can learn more about me at electrachelwalden.com. All right, candidates, thank you very much. Let's get things started. And Ms. Kelly, we'll start with you, and we'll start with the basics here. What is the role of the Arizona Corporation Commission? 
Great, Ted. So the role, as everyone you know, usually says, is fair and just and reasonable rates. Um, that is our duty. We want to make sure when we flip the light switch that the lights come on, that our rates stay low, that we stay on the grid. We cannot afford to be like our neighbor, California, and falling off the grid. But there is an and in there that people forget. And that and does allow us to create reasonable and just policies to further cheap rates, affordable rates for the ratepayers. And so I think that we do need to lean into that, especially in this environment where we are paying 27% more in utilities across the board in Arizona than we need to. Uh, Mr. Lopez, again, th th we're, uh, the Arizona Corporation Commission flies under the radar in a lot of elections and with a lot of uh, campaigns and such, but it's an important position. What is the role of the commission? So, I mean, as defined by the state constitution established when, in 1912. So, again, it's the reliability of the grid uh, energy-wise, and uh, you hit on it in your introductions too the affordability, and also the safety, pipeline safety, railroad safety. We also deal with incorporating corporations. So it's, it, 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 it's a lot to it, especially the equity and securities. A lot of people tend to forget about that. Uh, line siting, so anytime power lines are coming into the communities, they have oversight on that. So again, it, it affects uh, a lot of the Arizonans every day. And I think where, where the rubber meets the road and where the commission really has the biggest impact to Arizona residents is that rate setting. That's really the highest visibility, right? Because that's what everybody sees every month when that bill comes in. And so I think that is uh, really probably what we're gonna talk about a lot more today. Uh, but again, there is a, a myriad and a spectrum of uh, uh, responsibilities that the Corporation Commission does have. For, uh, Ms. Marquez-Peterson, again, for those who aren't familiar with the Corporation Commission, not sure what it does other than, you know, they, they see it every once in a while in a rate case, what is the role? Yeah, it's an important board for the state and impacts everybody's wallet, whether it's their family uh, budget or their business. We provide just and reasonable rates. We ensure the utilities are providing the correct capital investment necessary, that the grid is stable, and that we have energy reliability. So it's a real balance we play at the commission, ensuring that rates are affordable while we're also ensuring energy reliability. We don't want to see rolling blackouts like California. We don't want to see impacts to, to folks at their homes by having energy outages or any kind of spikes and so on. So the commission plays an important role. I'm also a former Chamber of Commerce president, and we incorporate every business in the state. Uh, and that's an important role for the state also and for our future economy. Ms. Walden, the role of the ACC. Yes, it's to protect the ratepayer. The ratepayers of Arizona, they don't have a say in their service territory. So it is a government monopolies that we're working with. And our job is to ensure that we are upholding the Constitution, that the rates are just and reasonable. And we do that in a variety of ways. Uh, one of the things the commission should be doing and currently is, is all source RFPs, requests for proposal to make sure that all sources of generation are presented to the commission so we can balance out what's the most affordable but also what's going to be reliable. And that's the bulk of, of the energy policy of the commission is that we should only allow those bases to be, those things to be determined for what our energy should be. So it's not about implementing a political agenda or a climate agenda. It's about doing what is affordable and what is reliable for the grid. That should drive all the decisions when we're talking about energy. Sticking with you, uh, protecting ratepayers versus protecting utilities. Where do you fall? Well, we need to have a responsive and efficient organization for the utilities to work with. They don't have a choice but to come to the commission. Right now, we're lowest in the country for approving rate cases. It takes us 18 months. The national average is nine months. That cost of the regulatory lag gets passed down to the rate payer. So we need to be able to be efficient so that our utilities don't have to spend a whole bunch of money working with us. But our constitutional role is to put what's best for the rate payer first. Whoever benefits pays. If they're going to do something that benefits the rate payer, then the rate payer can reimburse them in the rates. But if the utility is doing something to benefit themselves, like for their shareholders, that's on the utility to pay for. Uh, rate payers over utility, is that where the balance lies, you think, in the Corporation Commission? It does. I mean, we see about 40 to 50 rate cases a year. We regulate about 400 utilities. People don't realize how many water utilities actually we serve also. They know us mostly for electric. But it's an important balance we play. So it's there, we need to ensure, as I said earlier, that they're making the right capital investment so that rate payers are protected, that they have energy reliability, they have water sustainability, and it's all done at affordable rates. Where do you find the balance, Mr. Lopez? Well, again, with my history on the city council, we had to deal with this every other year when we had to do cost of services evaluations. So I'm no stranger to it, 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 reviewing rate cases. 
But as the key word here is you're hearing, it's balanced. I mean, we, we can't do anything if we don't have utilities that are able to grow and keep reliable energy power to our grid. But we do need to balance that with the, 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 the back-breaking rates that are keeping coming in due to inflation and other reasons that driven by the federal government policies that are driving our rates up. So again, we do maintain that balance and we need to ensure the utilities are making proper investments. And again, by deeping into, diving deep into those rate cases to make sure they are planning for the future. And again, compensating for the proper right moves that they're doing and in investing in our grid to make sure that Arizona, as, as uh, uh, Commissioner Peterson uh, mentioned, uh, that we need, the only way we get to grow the state is by making sure we have a stable grid that is reliable for companies to grow and people to move here that know that they're going to have safe water and a stable grid. Uh, Ms. Kelly, the, uh, the idea of market principles. If um, I could just chime in on that Oh, please a do, bit. please do. So I'm a mediator, and we balance equities in mediation and in law. So when you have one party that doesn't have as much power as the other, here the rate payer, you have to take them into account. And let's be honest, our rate payers do not feel like they are in control right now. They feel, let's just, the elephant in the room. The previous, you know, ACC has been too heavily on the side of the utility companies. So ratepayers think. Whether it's true or not, that's debatable. But they feel like that we have been too far on the side of um, the, the corporations. So we need to balance the equity, <coughs> bring them to the table, make them, even when we raise their rates, we need to make sure they understand why. So Ms. we need Marquez to take that Peterson, into you want to respond to yeah, that, I would please? like to respond to that. Thank you. When we have a rate case, uh, we have months of public hearings. We have lots of public testimony. We tell people they can either email in information, they can zoom into the meetings, they can come personally down to our sessions to, to make sure that their, their voice is heard. Those of us serving on the commission now are not utility industry experts. We are coming from a ratepayer perspective. I have uh, not worked for a utility. I come from a small business background. I live in southern Arizona, so making sure voice is heard throughout the state. Uh, but I think it's important that uh, ratepayer voices are heard, and that's really the role of the commission. We are liaisons. M Ms. Waldman, do you believe that the public believes that the Corporation Commission is on the ratepayer side? No, I, I don't think that, that I, I think you're going to hear a mixed bag because as we already addressed, a lot of people don't understand what the commission does. And when I talk to people and I explain some of the history of the commission, then they really see the complexities of the role. And in fact, a lot of commission roles have hurt utility companies like the renewable energy standard and tariff that was passed that said that 15% of all energy had to come from renewables and the commission forced our utility companies into renewables when they weren't ready. And that drove up the cost because they had to start generating an emerging technology. And anytime the commission does a mandate, there's a rate of return that gets passed on to the rate pair. So that commission decision costs the rate pay more money. It wasn't in favor of the utilities. Uh, as far as the perception, Mr. Lopez, regarding the utility, the uh, Corporation Commission, um, is it, do you agree that people think that you're not necessarily on the side of the ratepayers? Right, and, and that is a perception. I believe that there's a lot of people. Is it, it no, is an accurate perception? I, I don't agree, but because again, like I said, we, we've had to raise rates and in Chandler, everything goes up. I mean, there isn't thing out there, and, and, and it's painful. We all experience it. We're all rate payers here. We're all business owners here that we have to pay this. So it's not like, again, we're not aware of the plight of people seeing the rates going up. But if there's a commissioner out there that actually starts advertising that there is no way they're going to ever raise rates again, they're deluding themselves. I mean, the cost of chlorine is up at over 300% over the last four years. The cost of natural gas is up as part of the federal uh, statutes. Coal is, is becoming more expensive. So all these have to be contributed and, 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 again, evaluated for how the rates are affected. But it becomes the communication to the public to making sure they understand. It, as it, was if discussed. I could just chime in, because I don't want it to be thought that, you know, of course, our job is rate payers. You know, we have to raise rates. Rate, that's going to happen. But when you say that they have opportunity to chime in, it's kind of hard when they don't know the corporation exists. So I just spent um, three days in rural Mojave County. And what they say is the only time they see the commissioners is when they come to ask for their votes, those of them that even know of the commission. So what we need to be is when we raise rates or when we have really tough rate cases, we need to go back in the community, hold town halls, 
let them know why we had to vote how we did and actually be more in the community, be more accessible, and Ted, be more visible. Ted, can I visible. respond to that? Please. We, we are in the community quite often. We have held cold transition meetings in Navajo County area, Apache County. In fact, tonight I'm sitting here, but we're having a wildfire mitigation town hall in Prescott led by Commissioner Myers. So we're out in the community quite a bit and speaking to folks throughout the state. Um, I want to go back, Ms. Walton, to you and the idea of the uh, energy efficiency and renewable standards. Mm -hmm. um, the process of getting rid of those standards, which is underway, mm -hmm. uh, the idea of getting rid of those standards uh, has met with a lot of backlash from folks who are saying that it just simply sends the wrong message to the industry, to the solar industry, to the renewable energy industry. How do you respond to that? Well, the commission shouldn't be energy biased. We need to let the free market determine what can we get our energy for at the best cost that's also going to protect the reliability of the grid. Those are the two factors that, that we weigh in on on the commission. So in, in, in terms of like what we see in energy, what's been successful, you have a state like Texas or California, they're over over invested in solar and they have reliability issues uh, along with with wind. We have in Arizona right now a sort of an all of the above approach. We have a, a mixed energy portfolio and that works best because we can hedge against different market conditions. Energy prices fluctuate as Mr. Lopez already brought up and and reliability fluctuates. So it's sort it's almost like investing or you don't put all your eggs in one basket. You've got to hedge against different conditions. But but have not has had the standards not resulted in tens of thousands of new jobs, of, of uh, cutting dangerous pollution. That's what those who support the standards say. Are they wrong? No, we have the cleanest air in America. Our corporations are good stewards of the environment. America's already doing it. Our utilities in Arizona are already doing it. They're already good stewards of the environment. They put uh, scrubbers on all of the coal plants to make sure that the air is clean, that there's no haze coming off of the coal plants. Our nuclear power plant emits water into the atmosphere. So we're good stewards of the environment already. Uh, we are seeing a lot of investment in renewables already in the private sector, like the wind farm that went up in Winslow. That was funded from the Inflation Reduction Act. It was a private investment on private land. The utilities didn't have to build it. The private sector is already doing it. Uh, we have the cleanest air in America, Mr. Lopez? Yeah, um, many places. Yeah, and but again, it's all relative, right? I mean, the air in Arizona is very different from the air in Atlanta, Georgia. I mean, you, and, and that's the unfortunate that EPA and the federal government, a lot of people just realize that it, we're a different state. We're a different community. And the air in northern Arizona is different from the air in southern Arizona. So a lot of these mandates, and that's where I, I have an issue when you come back to the original question. Yes. When it comes to the mandates, that's where, again, the government picking winners and losers, there's a lot of unintended consequences that wind up happening. And when we do the mandates, that's the problem that comes in and it sneaks in is the cost. When everybody does talk about renewables, and it's just, you know, again, a little exposure here, a little uh, uh, heart on my sleeve, I don't know why nuclear doesn't get talked about more as a renewable. Mm -hmm. And that right there, in my opinion, is one of the reasons why we need to drop that the mandates is because we need to open this up full spectrum solar has been making its way into wind has been making its way into our grid now it's time for everybody to be on the equal playing field and allow us to pay the lowest rates that are available via rfp and have a wide portfolio because we need to fluctuate with this right because it's great to have solar wind nuclear coal gas we need it all because we don't know what's going to happen in the future. And one of those may go away. One of them may become more efficient with a breakthrough in the next year, next decade. And we want to be able to pull on those each lever to make sure that we can keep Arizona growing. And, and to keep Arizona growing, good idea to get rid of the renewable energy standards? So uh, I'll, I'll speak to that. You know, I, that's why this race is so critical. There's a lot at stake. In 2006, that renewable energy standard was put in place by the then commission. So they mandated a source of energy unnaturally so that it mm -hmm. caused a subsidy that APS customers have paid more than one and a half billion dollars since that time in 2006 for that uh, subsidy that occurred with renewable energy. I'm very pro-solar. I think it certainly should be part of the portfolio. I agree with Mr. Lopez that we need an all of the above approach. Uh, and so I think renewable energy will continue to grow. Arizona is still one of the fastest growing states in the country. We'll see renewable energies grow, but it needs to be one of the basket of energy resources that we're looking at to fuel our state. Ms. Kelly, I, how do you feel about yeah, this? Yeah, I had a question because I know I was, you know, like most of us, reviewing um, the debate, the previous debates, and I saw where Commissioner Peterson said that she wanted to go net zero by 2050 and how you wanted to go 100% renewables. 
Yeah, um, I'm glad you asked that. So in 2020, I stepped in as a appointed commissioner. We were in the middle of the debate. We were actually here with you, Ted, talking mm -hmm. about some of the important issues facing the state. Um, I do think that free market principles, as Ms. Walden has spoken about, has really driven things over the last four or five years. We have large companies coming to the state asking for clean energy portfolio. So I, I do not support a mandate for clean energy, but I think we do need an all of the above approach. Okay. So did you misspeak in that debate? No, I think as commissioners, we learn and grow and, and educate ourselves as we move forward in this position. So since 2020, when I'd been here about a year or so, and was in the middle of that debate, uh, that was my position at the time. And since then, I have grown to understand that we cannot have a mandate in the state of Arizona. Ms. Kelly, do you think we should have that particular mandate in Arizona? No, I don't. And I actually would go one step further because besides the mandates, what's really costing the ratepayers money is the ESG and DEI that's allowed to be um, pervasive in the utilities that we regulate. So unless we get rid of the environmental social governance, which is the catalyst for all of these sustainability goals, the resource plans are just going to continue to be laden with these policies that are costing us more money in the end. Are they costing us more money in the end or is the return on investment a smart move? No, it's not. No. So right now we pay, again, it was just testified to Congress that we pay 27 to 30 percent more in, in, than we should for our energy. We can't afford that here in Arizona. I was listening during the APS um, rate case and it really struck me um, this poor woman that lived in a motor home, she was talking about how she had to put stucco and put different things um, on her windows to shade the sun. We're already paying too much. Arizona cannot afford these costly policies. We'll never be able to get to net zero by 2050, but in their attempt to make us get there, they're wasting taxpayer money. Ms. Vald, the, the return on investment from the original standards, industry leaders and supporters say it's been a positive and it continues to grow. Are they wrong? Well, the, are you you're talking about the renewable energy standard and tariff that was implemented? I mean, anytime there's a mandate by the commission, it costs the ratepayer more money because they get a rate of return on commission mandates. And Free Enterprise Club has estimated that because of that investment in renewable energy, when it was still an emerging technology and the utilities were forced to invest in it, that it has cost Arizona $2.3 billion. So we shouldn't be forcing any kind of generation on our utility companies. And, and Mr. Lopez, last question on this. I believe as of 2022, we had like 10% of electricity generated by solar, according to the U.S. Energy Information Administration. 10%. This is Arizona. I mean, it, it, something seems out of whack. Is it out of whack? No, it's, it's, it's where the desires need. So, again, it, you have to parse it. This devil in the details, kind of like what Ms. Kelly said about some of the ESG and even the numbers. There are so many contributing factors and variables when you get into the cost of energy. It's not just the cost of production. It's the cost of capital. It's the cost of the land. It's the cost of the grid. It's the cost of, of running all the lines. And when we talk about, uh, you know, again, some of the other variables of why, why much solar, a lot of those numbers, and if you parse them down, they talk and don't separate necessarily photovoltaic versus mirrored and, you know, the, the, the molten salt. Uh, the generation of these solar panels, the, the solar heating of the pool, is that is that also counted? There's so many things that go into these that do not wind up getting considered. And again, that's why we have to be able to parse these these into deeper discussions. Please. And, yeah, I would like to add on solar, too, because it's not we don't have the technology to store the power. So it's great during the day, but nobody's at home during the day. So we get all this excess power. The batteries only store it for about three hours. And so what happens at night when everyone comes home from work in your peak hours is we're using a whole bunch of natural gas, which is a fluctuating price. We're still paying right now in Southwest gas for the <laughs> fact that gas went up 300 percent a couple years ago. We're still paying that off. So I'm I'm a fan of solar for part of a mixed portfolio. There's a place for solar and in different areas of, 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 of life, of farming, in different ways you can use it, but we can't be over-reliant on it because it just increases our reliance on natural gas. Ms. Kelly. Yeah, I would have to agree as well, but I also want to make sure, I mean, this is a Republican panel, and Republicans, I actually had someone say, hey, I can't vote for you because you don't like solar. No, that's not it. We do believe, or I should speak for myself, natural energy right now is going to be the cheapest form of energy. Let the market dictate when solar catches up. Does the market need help at times? 
No, I don't believe it does, Ted. Okay. And can um, I add, Ted? Yes, real please. Quickly that, I mean, after the renewable energy standard discussion occurred at the commission, I asked APS and TEP, what percentage renewable energy are we at this moment in time? And I was told 17% by each company. The renewable energy standard was set for 15% of retail sales. So we'd already graduated beyond that. With another reason for eliminating that renewable energy standard. Uh, Ms. Marquez-Peterson, I want to stick with you, and I want to talk about this recent rate, APS rate hike, um, uh, reportedly uh, in, uh, in great part uh, by the parent company of APS, Pinnacle West, uh, to reassure lenders, reassure lenders that they are viable and that the profit streams are good and the profitability, credit rating are all strong. Is that a strong enough reason for a rate hike? So I need to be careful in that the rate case has been appealed and I'm a sitting commissioner, so can't prejudge. Uh, but no, I think in terms of what direction we go and we're determining what are the right rates and what, what is the capital investment that's required and the return on investment, I'm not considering how the markets respond. I'm looking at ratepayer impact in the state of Arizona. Uh, Mr. Lopez, what do you think about that? The idea that profitability and uh, credit ratings and these sorts of things of the parent company need to be uh, a factors in rate cases? Not in the rate case, but they are a factor in, again, the re future reliability and the future investment of these uh, corporations. So, and again, it comes down to, if APS is no longer a viable company and they have to pull up chocks and, and leave Arizona, I mean, that's not good for anyone in Arizona. So we do need to make sure they're viable. They do have a profitability. But again, to, as I, I said in the beginning, it's not a consideration for the rate case. That's more of a management issue that APS and SRP, we don't do SRP, but any other utility that does wind up coming forward, that's part of their management and uh, uh, long-term investments that we would need to evaluate, but it would not be considered part of the rate. Would you have voted to approve this rate increase? Uh, minus the stuff that a lot of the commissioners had already amended and removed, uh, yes. Uh, Ms. Walden, would you have approved this latest APS rate increase? So I haven't reviewed all the documentation. I mean, there was there was 500 pages of documentation of things that APS had to build. So our rates are historical. The utility has to pay for the energy generation first, and then they get reimbursed in the rate. So we are back paying the utility companies, and they presented documentation of natural gas expansion, transmission lines, transformer replacements, all that stuff that runs goes into infrastructure and keeping the lights on, keeping things reliable. So I, I would have, I think based on that, I would have had to approve by the Arizona Constitution that says those things can be reimbursed, uh, a rate increase. I don't know by how much. I absolutely approve. They cut $200 million of programs out of the rates. We should not have any subsidies. We should not have special interest programs. The rate should be pure, exactly what it costs to generate that energy for that customer, and that's it. Ms. Kelly, what would you have done if you were on the commission and this rate increase came to you? I would have slowed it down tremendously because, again, the rate case was largely based on having to assure investors. One of the commissioners came on an interview, I just watched it with you, shortly after, and that's what he said the reason was. So that is not a good enough reason, as has been said. Also, I know it was like 11 hours, but it was still rushed. By the next day, we didn't know what the exact percentage was going to be. There was too much uncertainty when they approved what the rate case, that, that rate case. Another reason that I would have um, stalled it some or put it off is because five days later, we learned that they were, I think, 500 million actually um, up the company versus what we were told. Right, the, the, the uh, ROI there uh, for Pinnacle West went from 8.9 to 9.5 just because of the rate increase. Was it, I, I know you can only say so much here, but would it have not been wiser to wait for those revenue, that revenue report to come out? You know, we, we took 18 months on the APS rate case. That's a lot of public hearings, lots of public comment. Uh, our judge that assisted with that case did a, a lot of work to put that together. I don't think additional de delay was needed. In every rate case that we see, we have debate on the floor. We hear from public, we change and tweak what we're doing and ultimately come out with a vote on the recommended order. I don't think a further delay would have changed anything. In the 2017 rate case, Based on what happened with that APS rate case, the rate came out. It ended up being three times the amount. And I think those are different facts case. during that APS rate case. But I again, the next morning, people woke up. Again, if you're thinking about the consumer, their rate, they're already paying 12% more 
just because of the market, just because of line items adjustments. Yeah, I think this was an, an 8% increase that was determined in this APS rate case, and it was not something that should have been delayed. We often talk on the campaign trail about efficiencies and doing things to serve the rate payer better, and I think pushing this out even further would not have served the rate Pushing payer. it out, but days later to get that report. Yeah, but again, in the end, I'll address that one, but it was talked about that it was originally asked of a 10%, it came back that they believed it was gonna be 8.55, when they actually, a few days, weeks later, evaluated the total number of impact, or the total percentage impact to the actual rate payer, it came out to 7.8 something, I think, if I remember correctly. So it came out, again, better. Look, and again, we've already talked about this one, too, that the rates are going to go up. But when you talked about also APS in, in their, uh, you know, efficiency and their, in, uh, their uh, ability to be funded in, in their investor uh, credit ratings, what if they had been mismanaged? What if they came back and said that they were in the hole? Does that mean that we have to put that mismanagement on the backs of the ratepayers? This goes both ways if you talk about unintended consequences. That's why we have to stay focused on what the Constitution says and look at, as, as uh, Ms. Walden said, we look at the historical prices that, that, that they invested in and reimburse them for that. But, but, but real quickly, you, you say what if X, Y, or Z, why not find out X, Y, or Z and wait a few days Because longer? it's not supposed to be weighed in the decision making. Because again, if a company is being mismanaged or properly managed, you know, great for APS and Pinnacle West. They're managing their company very well and their credit ratings went up. Great for them. But in the end, the rate decisions need to be based on the facts that are presented in the rate case, not how they're being managed. And I think it's important to note, too, because we pay historical rates, that the utilities get investors, but they also take out loans. So if they have a poor credit rating, when they take out loans for their projects, they pay high interest rates. That can equate to hundreds of millions of dollars that gets put on the back of the ratepayer. So having a healthy utility is actually cheaper for the ratepayer because the utility can get loans at a low interest rate. Yeah, but again, I'm going back to the timing and waiting a couple of days more. Doesn't make any difference to you one way or the other? Well, because they already reduced it. So the regulatory law judge approved the row to be 100 basis points higher than what the commission approved. So not only did they give them a lower row than the regulatory law judge said, and they cut $200 million of programs out of the rates, I think they felt like they had they had done their job. Saying, could they have waited the next morning and voted on it the next morning? Sure. They could have done that, but I don't think that they erred in voting on it that night. Uh, Ms. Kelly, I want to start with you on this one. Uh, using ratepayer funds to help coal communities transition away from coal, should those funds be used for that purpose? I don't think so. I, again, I, I don't think that helping to transition um, away from coal or to a renewable source should be something that should be on the backs of, of ratepayers. Again, let the market determine when we make adjustments. When we pulled out prematurely um, from coal, we left these communities decimated. We pulled out too early. In California, they're going back to some of their natural energy sources because they pulled out prematurely. Now, I'm also going to go back to why are we pulling out prematurely? It's because of environmental social governance. Right? If we take away the, the reason why they're doing this, then we will let the market dictate when we make these changes, not some arbitrary social, social credit score. Uh, Ms. Marquez-Peterson, what is a fair share of cold community transition? You know, that's a debate we've been having for years at the commission. The different entities have come forward asking for funding to come from ratepayers throughout that territory to help that coal impacted community. Um, after a lot of debate and learning and educating, I wrote a letter to the docket, which are like online folders, you can see our position, that said we need economic development planning in our coal impacted communities. We need to be working now that APS and TEP have said they're going to exit coal in 2031, 2032 or later. What, what can we do to help prepare those communities? But I did not feel comfortable and voted no at the time to writing a check to those communities to somehow make them whole. I thought that wasn't the right setting for, for all of uh, ratepayers to, to be beholden to that. Mr. Lopez, ratepayers responsible for funding that transition to those communities? No. No, but then, again, what Ms. Kelly said, too, about the coal transition, that's not policy that we are dictating, um, or even the ESG. That's the federal government policies that are killing coal. One of the, again, the lawsuits that happened with our coal plants, because the EPA was forcing them to shut down. That's not policies that we can, can, can control. So this is a, that's also a federal uh, involvement, and again, over, in my opinion, overstepping their bounds into our mm -hmm. state and how we can set up our profile within the state of Arizona. 
for them to leave us alone. We're not a homogenous United States. We, we should be able to do what we I need to in order to keep our rates reasonable and affordable. Ms. Walden. I agree. The EPA is an unconstitutional agency. Ever since Obama's haze rules, the federal government has been going after coal, uh, suing utilities to shut coal plants down. They're not, they're not, the utilities aren't shutting them down over some, some investment score. They're shutting them down because the EPA sued them to shut them down, and, and that's what we're up against. But it shouldn't be the backs of the ratepayer that has to pay for it. I think we have to look at keeping our coal plants open as long as possible and look at the cost of that. But eventually, if we can't stop the federal government, they're going to continue to be unaffordable. Now they're regulating the water that coal plants use. Uh, I, 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 I do agree that this has a federal component, but I do also want to push back a little bit when you say it's not because of some, you know, social credit score. So again, let me define what ESG is, right? What they're doing is they wanted these progressive policies or they want DEI not because they necessarily want to save the planet or hire more in black, black and brown people. If they pledge allegiance to these sustainability goals, then they will get a better credit rating. And so it will improve their bottom line. It's the Black Street, it's the Larry Finks, it's that model. So unless we get that out of the utilities that we govern, all of the resource plans are gonna be laid into it. They're gonna push to divest from coal, divest from natural resources. That is what is causing us to pay more money here in Arizona. Mr. Lopez, uh, ratepayers benefited from these plants for years. Mm -hmm. Should they not be responsible for helping these communities transition? Well, the communities benefited also, right? I mean, everybody did. It's, it, 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 and it's a cost-benefit analysis, right? Those communities <coughs> knew what they were getting. They were going to get employment, and they were going to get a lot of uh, uh, activity. In their in their neighborhoods and again in uh, taxpayer funds and and sales tax and so on so the communities do I mean it's a relationship that they have with the utility so they knew what they were getting into now when we say that they're going to be changing over again like uh, Commissioner uh, Marcus Peterson said we do need to do economic planning with them but that's more outside of the Arizona corporation we need to stay in our wheelhouse we're here to do rates. Um, We're here to oversee yeah. that. And I would We're not to. here to drive economic plans for the entire state. The, the idea that, that rate payers benefited from what these communities offered and what they worked for and what, in some cases, they benefited from as well, uh, time to help them transition. So I, I agree with the, the comments that Mr. Lopez made. I think there are opportunities for the future also. He mentioned nuclear. I'm a big proponent of nuclear energy. I actually chair a national nuclear task force in our industry that talks about advanced technologies and small modular nuclear reactors. I mention that because that could potentially be an opportunity for our, our coal plants in the future that would save jobs, that would provide uh, industry growth for those particular areas. So I think there are other opportunities and innovations that could be occurring before those coal plants close. Did you want to request? I, I just. You were just cheering I, I on I talk about this, that, yeah, cheering on nuclear. Cheering on nuclear. 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 Okay. Nuclear. I, I think that that doesn't get addressed enough uh, in this day and age. I mean, the, the last plant was mm -hmm. approved in 79. Just it took, what, almost 50 years for them to finally get approval uh, to go online. So there's, again, nuclear is, is, and again, one of the many options that we can have in our portfolio to ensure that we've got a good, stable uh, baseline. And that's where I, I really am worried about. The future of Arizona is we're dropping with the coal plants. We're losing our baseline power. Mm -hmm and we're not replacing it with anything other than more expensive gas and solar. So for each of you then, we'll, we'll do a 45 second uh, rebuttal qu uh, question here. Should Arizona focus more on, and we'll start with you, Ms. Marcus Peterson, on traditional sources, natural, gas, coal, and what most people see as traditional nuclear? N well, I'd say no, we shouldn't focus. Again, it should be an all of the above approach. Right now we're about our energy in Arizona is about 30% nuclear, about 28% natural gas, about the same in coal with the remainder being renewable energy. We need to continue to allow the utilities to do that all source RFP that Ms. Walden spoke about and find the very best lowest cost resource that provides reliability for the state of Arizona. Need a more of a focus on traditional methods? Absolutely. For right now, the market is dictating that that is our most reliable sources of energy. It's the cheapest most affordable sources of energy. Again, if you go back to what is best for the Arizona ratepayer, our electricity, our energy is too high. We're paying 30% more across the board than we should in Arizona for our, for our utilities. 
we can't afford these policies, these Green New Deal policies, the market just is not there for them, and they should not be made to artificially have to buy into them. And this is obviously a traditional uh, Republican uh, panel here, so let's talk about traditional uh, energy sources. Again, Ms. Walden, focus on those, uh, I wouldn't say at the expense of renewable, but as much, if not more so, than renewable? No, it's, it's, it's not our place to be energy biased. It's, that's why we do the RFP, so we look at all sources of generation. These, re, these integrated resource plans the utilities submit, the commission reviews them every couple of years. Their blueprint, it's 10 to 15 years in the future, but then they're reviewing it every couple of years to keep it current, looking at what's gonna be best for the ratepayer. And that's what we're statutorily tasked with, is protecting the ratepayer. We're not a fourth branch of government. We shouldn't be writing policy and laws. We can let the legislature do that. There's 90 people downtown that can do that. You have five people on the commission. You only need three people to pass something. Three people is not a big enough voice for the entire state of Arizona, so we should do what the Constitution says. And it is focusing on keeping the rates, the rates down and the utilities reliable. But and according to the Johnston utility case, and according to the Arizona Constitution, we are allowed to create policy in furtherance of keeping the rates reliable and affordable. And we can do policy. So we are allowed to do that. But anything part that of, we do... Excuse me. Hold on. Part of the policy that we need to do is to make sure that these energy plans are not, uh, the resource plans are not leaning so heavily into Green New Deal that we are causing more the ratepayers to have to pay more money long term. Ms. Walden. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. That's why we always have to balance out the reliability of, of the grid. But I just want to caution that anything the commission does in mandate gets passed down with the rate of return. So it costs more money for the commission to dictate policy than for the utilities to do it themselves. Except when Justin Olson was a ratepayer and he stepped in and he created policy that said no vaccine mandates and no mask mandates with no pushback. Right, and we're, 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 we're kind of, yeah. I, I want to get back to you and the idea of focusing on traditional energy sources. So again, what Ms. Walden said is 100% again, I, I'm in agreement with. I mean, it's, it's based on the rate uh, cases themselves, it's based on the Constitution and our role. We need to stay within our wheelhouse. And what Justin Olson did, he's a great guy, I know him very well, but I don't agree with that. That's, that's overstepping bounds because when when government gets involved and starts get doing things that they're not edicted supposed to do and it's not in their wheelhouse, it can flip either way and there's a lot of unintended consequences that happen that. And that's the same thing with any, dictating any ESG policies. There's a lot of unintended consequences when it comes down to the financial viability and also the energy portfolio because God forbid there's a breakthrough in solar and now there can't be any more solar in Arizona even though it's become very efficient. So that's where Again, that's why we need to be fact-based and on historical based on the rates. Um, I, last question here. Um, we've talked a lot about energy concerns, utilities and such. What is the one non-energy and non-utility issue of most concern to the Arizona Corporation Commission and to you as a possible uh, commissioner? Ms. Walden, we'll start with you. You said non-utilities, so you're not talking about water companies? Uh, we, well, we, we can go water if you'd like, but I'm, <laughs> the, the, the commission does so many other things that people aren't even aware of. Yeah, well, the, the, well uh, but the commission does a great job, so we're one of the best in the country for railroad safety, and the commission does oversee railroad safety. Uh, we have a fraud division for securities fraud, and there's actually people that proactively will find fraudulent cases before consumers even harmed by them. Them. So they're, they're, those things are, are going really well. But yeah, we hear all the time about the utilities because that's about 90% of it. Uh, I brought up the water companies because that does get forgotten. We don't do water rights, but the water rates and the infrastructure is really important. And we have a lot of small mom and pop water companies that are broke, that don't have investors, that have bad infrastructure. That's going to be a lot of the commission's time in 2025 and going forward. Interesting. All right, Ms. Kelly, again, non-utility, uh, non you know, electric and solar and everything we've talked about, Things that people don't, they're not even aware of that the commission is involved in. What's of most concern, do you think? I think the most concern is they're not aware that the commission exists. I mean, when I'm just out knocking doors, they're like, I didn't even know that you exist, much less one of the most powerful offices in Arizona. So I think just having more awareness that we're here. If you want to start a business, this is the one-stop shop. If you have a problem um, with the utility or if you have a problem with one of the mom and pop um, water companies, we're here. Securities, if you have an issue with that, come file a complaint. That is, the, that is a thing that the commission does well. 
if you file a complaint, if you file an inquiry, they will call you back. But it's difficult when I'd say 50% of Arizonans have never heard of the Corporation Commission. That needs to change. Ms. Marquez-Peterson, you're on the commission, so you, you, you know what's happening here, but you know also know what is not happening. Is there something not happening that needs to happen? Now, I, I'm going to talk a little bit more about small water utilities. We have about 350 of them in the state of Arizona. And again, we don't determine the quantity of water or the quality of water. Different agencies do that, but we handle that infrastructure of water. When I was a first appointed commissioner, I hosted a workshop on small water utilities because we had 70 water utilities that hadn't had a rate case in more than 25 years. And a lot of people would say, great, no rate case, but that's, that's not good. That's an area we need improvement. We've seen some dramatic improvements during that time. We've seen some acquisitions and some consolidations occur, uh, but we need to ensure that these small water utilities are regulated in the very best way to ensure the quality and, uh, of water, certainly in, uh, something that we regulate, that we ingest, so it's so important to public safety. And I think we need to continue work on small water utilities. What do you think, Mr. Lopez? Yeah, the same. Uh, water, again, was, was a big subject, and I wish we, oh, we had spent more time because that is very critical. Well, go ahead. you got the time. Space. Spend it. <laughs> all right. All right. got 30 minutes, right? So, uh, so again, the, the complexity of water in the state of Arizona, and a lot of people don't even understand it. Yes, we have a source of Colorado River, but we also have the Verde and Salt Rivers. We've got uh, well water. And, again, there's a lot, a myriad that people don't really understand on how the, the aquifers work within the entire state of Arizona. That one city is very dependent upon Colorado, whereas one other may not be. And so we do talk about the water crises that we're experiencing, and we seem to be uh, maybe skirted a little bit this cycle. But again, it's something we have to be very, very conscious of in the state of Arizona. And again, staying in our wheelhouse, we set the water rates. We go to a lot of the smaller private utilities, and we make sure that they're doing those proper investments. But again, that's where I think that is, is the most concerning possibly in the future. Again, with the federal uh, review that's going to be happening with the Colorado Compact coming up in the next few years, that I think and how the water allotments happen with the Colorado River, I think that's going to be a major undertaking that uh, a lot of people, I think it's going to be an, ha all hands on deck of understanding on how we're going to deal with that in the future. And I also think the SMRs, and really wanted to talk more nuclear, but the SMRs, again, that's a real passion of mine. You know, my, my first love language was, was nuclear power. So, um, you know, I, I think that is an emerging technology with SMRs and microreactors that really we in Arizona can be in the forefront of in the future. Um, we have a little bit of time left before closing statements, so let's make it about 30 seconds each for, for all of you on this one. A former commissioner, or a soon-to-be former commissioner, has said that the commission needs a shakeup uh, to address issues that are important to ratepayers. Ms. Kelly, we'll start with you. Does the commission need a shakeup? I think it does, in the sense of it's still, Republicans do a good job on the commission. Um, in full transparency, my opponents on the stage are all running on a slate. I'm running by myself. If you couldn't tell, they're co-signing each other a lot. It needs a shakeup because we need to put Arizona first. We need to put Arizonans first. We need to talk about kitchen table issues and make it relatable to them as far as their energy concerns. Got your 30 seconds. Ms. Walden, uh, a shakeup <coughs> needed? I think a shakeup's been going on already. Uh, when we elected Nick Myers and Kevin Thompson and we got a new dynamic on the commission, so they addressed the energy efficiency rules. Those, they found rules going all the way back to 1998 that they voted to repeal. Uh, they're talking about what they need to do about the solar buyback program. They closed in the first month hundreds of things that were just open that didn't need to be open that were just something that could have been closed in consent agenda. They got a new executive director. They are getting new staff in there. So we're already seeing that shakeup. All right, uh, Ms. Marquez-Peterson, shakeup needed? I, I agree with Ms. Walden. We have seen a shakeup. We are, act we are seeing lots of activity that she spoke to. I did want to mention, though, since being appointed, we did pass a code of ethics, and we talked a lot about keeping the utilities out of these races and the importance of clean election campaigns. Mm -hmm. Three of us on the stage are running as clean election candidates, and I think that's an important piece. That's part of the shakeup of the commission. What do you think, Mr. Lopez? I mean, is shakeup needed? Yeah, uh, again, Commissioner Myers and Thompson have started that shakeup. And, and what I think I can bring to that table is having run the fourth largest water utility in the state, having a Six Sigma black belt in process improvement and running multiple, you know, $100 million projects and looking at budgets and being able to evaluate what needs to stay, what needs to go, and how can we sharpen the saw to make sure that the commission is running very efficiently and effectively. So really quickly, because yes. the commissioner um, mentioned clean elections. I hopped in this race in November, which is extremely late. 
there's no way that I would have been able to make the clean election threshold. But what I am doing is I am not taking money from anyone that we, regu that we regulate. I'm not even taking money from solar. So I have, don't have any donations from anyone that we regulate. So I am abiding by the clean elections um, mandate. That, that idea of utilities helping with political campaigns. Ms. Walden, what are your thoughts on that, real quickly? Well, I'm running clean elections, so. Well, I, I know I, you, that's, so, yeah, that I mean, could be the case, that, That's what the are your answer, thoughts? right? Like, I, I, I don't think that they should be interfering with, with elections. Uh, we have a lot of organizations that do. They, they, they rate politicians on all sorts of scales and things that have never been vetted. So, I mean, we, we've got a lot of different voices that try to influence how people vote. But for sure, if we're regulating an industry, absolutely you can't take money from them. But, but even with but clean elections, excuse hold, me, hold a lot on, of the on, donors, a lot of your big donor costs in Arizona, it's surprising how many donors have ties to utilities. And especially because we are the Corporation Commission, every company has to file through the commission. So it's a huge regulatory arm. And I, I do respect the clean elections process, and that's why I'm running. Mr. Clean. Lopez, the idea of utilities helping campaigns that elect utility regulators. No, I mean, that's that's a complete conflict of interest, 100%. And that's why I'm happy that the commission passed that ethics requirement that they, that's a requirement, but again, the ethics uh, policy, I guess, that if you're taking money from utility, you're not allowed to, 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 to vote on those because when you're talking, as we talked about, hundreds of millions, billions of dollars that are affecting their bottom line, that's a lot of influence and that needs to stay out. Last word on this, Ms. Marquez-Peterson. Uh, I'm proud to be a clean elections candidate. That means that we're soliciting $5 donations that you can make right through our website, or in my case, voteforlea.com. We are doing that so that we're not beholden to utilities and they're not unduly influencing our races. So All it's important. Right. All right, thank you, both candidates. Thank you very much. It's time now for closing statements. And again, going in alphabetical order, we start with Christy Kelly. Great. Well, tonight, I think you've heard a clear difference. Um, there is a slate running, and I respect everyone on the stage, um, but I am standing alone in calling for an end to environmental social governance and DEI in the utilities that we govern. These are costing us more money. I am also calling for the commission to put Arizonans first, to bring the commission down to Arizonans' level because most people don't know what we do. Now, I did hear our, our our commissioner, our seating commissioner, say it was only an, an 8% rate hike um, for the APS. But I think what most Arizonans will say is that was on top of 12% that we already paid more and on top of a brutal summer that we have coming. So again, Christy Kelly, you can go to christykelly.org. I am asking for your vote. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now the closing statement from Renee Lopez. Yes, thank you, Ted. So um, thank you for the time uh, tonight. And also, uh, hopefully you've learned a little bit more about each of us. Uh, I hope to have earned your support for running for Arizona Corporation Commission. And if you do want to learn more about me, you can go to Renee, votereneelopez.com. That's vote, R-E-N-E, lopez.com. And I hope you have a great night. All right, thank you very much. And for our next closing statement, we tune to Leah Marquez-Peterson. Thank you. So I'm Leah Marquez-Peterson. I'm running for re-election to the commission. I uh, have been proud to serve the state of Arizona, would like to continue serving and focusing on energy reliability at the lowest cost possible. Uh, there's a lot at stake in this race. You've heard a lot of the key issues tonight. Thank you again for, for, for watching and for participating with us here. Um, I do want to point out in 2020, I was the top Republican vote getter in that race, was able to serve you in that regard, and I know how to win in this state uh, in the upcoming general election. I would appreciate your support at voteforlea.com and for that $5 contribution, please. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. And time for our final closing statement. And we turn to Rachel Walden. Rachel Walden, I would be honored to have your vote in the primary and then in the general in November. And I'm running to put Arizona first. I feel genuinely concerned about the future of this country. We are up against so many hardships right now. And I want to ensure that my daughter gets to grow up in the same kind of country that I got to grow up in. And I'm committed to making sure that Arizona remains affordable and reliable. And we've outlined various ways that we can do that. And there's even, even more things to talk about. So I encourage you to visit my website at Alexa. RachelWalden.com. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for watching tonight's debate. Our next Arizona Horizon debate will be April 16th as we hear from the Democratic candidates running for Congressional District 3. 
That's Tuesday, April 16th at 5 p.m. on Arizona Horizon, and you can watch all of our shows live on ArizonaPBS.org or streamed live on YouTube and Facebook. And that is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening.